We ready? Let's do it. Welcome to the Uncut Podcast. I'm Pastor Luke. I'm Pastor Cameron. And this is the Uncut Podcast, where we have uncut and honest conversations about faith, life, and ministry. Um, today on the Uncut Podcast, we're going to be talking about adding a second service to uh, to our church specifically, but figured we would have kind of a conversation around, because it's kind of a big change. If you've got a church that's got one single service and mm-hmm. you get to a point where you decide to split that service into two kind of um, and add a different service, that's like a big change to a congregation. Um, and it was something, had you ever, you'd never led a church oh, yeah. through, you had? Yeah, no, we've... The previous church there was at, we had two services, and then... Did you lead the transition, though? Mm, I think so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I did. Okay. Yeah, I yeah. did. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. So you've got some experience with it before. Some. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I've been at a church... I've, I've attended... I've been at churches that have multiple services, but I've never seen the transition done for either. Yeah. Or, well, I've never seen it done. I should mm-hmm. say you have, but... You know, and you know our unique context and and stuff, and so I don't know. We just thought we'd get on here, and this is kind of like in the it's in the context of tr- like you call it like conversations on church growth, yeah, or like the philosophy of church growth, yeah, the practicality of church growth, and mm-hmm. whatever, yeah. You know, like so, we have we have a sanctuary here at Conduit that holds. I don't know if you call it comfortably or uncomfortably, but like two hundred. 200 is like, ain't no one else coming in. Yep. Um, 150, 160 is pretty full. Yep. Is pretty, pretty full. Especially with pews, because we have yes. pews in our in our yeah. service. Well, we, we have about 40 seats of like chairs. Chairs in the back. In the back. And those are always full. Yep. So the whole thing is full. Yeah, the whole sanctuary and the parking lot, and the parking lot is full, yep. and the con- and the the kids ministry rooms are full. Yep. Everything's full. Full. One service on a Sunday morning, um, and the energy is great. Yeah, the feeling in the building is great. Mm-hmm. The um, the room is loud. Yep, to see everyone. Yep, a lot of energy during preaching. A yep. lot of engagement. It's great. Yep, all of it is great. And so during during Easter, I think one of my. Which was which was packed for us this year, more than almost three hundred. Yeah, yeah, which is way more than we've had before. Mm-hmm. And I remember getting up to do do announcements and the hosting and welcome everybody there. And I could see some regular attenders had pulled up chairs in the center aisle yeah. to sit next to the pew, so they could sit next to their family because they were yep. spilling out of the pew. Yep. So it was kind of cool to see. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Um. So then the question is as well, wouldn't you like, okay, your church has grown, it's big, it's successful. Is that the, is that it? Right. Like, what do you do at that point? Do you just say, all right, this is as big as we are. Yeah. And we're not going to get any bigger. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think if you, I think if you ask, my, my, my guess is, is that if you asked just a, a random person that goes to church mm-hmm. say, would you, do you want your church to grow? Do you want your church to say the same size or do you want it to shrink? Mm-hmm. What do you think that they would say? I would think most people would say right. that they want it to grow. Correct. I agree because that's like, that is a, f- a marker of something, that is, that's something like a temporary good is marker of spiritual health. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. Um, and so then when we grow, then the question is, okay, well, what happens when we grow to capacity Mm -hmm. is growth over then? Right. Um, and so one of the reasons, one of the things that we, um, had been discussing for a long time is like, okay, we are pretty much grown to capacity Mm -hmm. in our building. I was actually one of the things I said to you might've been the, when we, when I interviewed with you. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is I said, are you thinking about what are you thinking about the capacity of this church? Mm-hmm. And you were like, yep. 
that was almost three years, three years ago. ago. Yeah, we've I had that first conversation with you about it. We are admittedly behind yes. on this. We we could have or should have probably done it a couple of years ago. Yeah. But whatever. Yeah. Here we are, right? And we are starting a second service. And so the question is, well, why? Why not just leave it the way it is? Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to kind of have a conversation around some common topics, questions, mostly questions. We have a lot of questions and statements that we're going to kind of organize our yeah. conversation around this about. Mm -hmm. And maybe it'll be helpful for people who want to look in and think about their church and their context. Mm -hmm. But then we're also doing it for very practical reasons of just like wanting to offer, uh, look for anyone who's in our congregation who's going through this change with us mm -hmm. and say like, how and why are we thinking about it the way we're thinking about yep. it? Yep. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, okay. So why? Why would we add another service? Well, um, I don't know if many people know this stat. This is a stat I just recently learned this week. Chicago County, where we live, where we're located, Chicago County, New York, Western New York. Um, what percentage of the population do you think goes to church on Sunday? Oh, that's an interesting question. Here in Chautauqua County. Mm -hmm. 40%? 18%. Whoa. Yeah, 18%. So that okay. means that there's, you know, 82% of the population mm -hmm. in Chicago County, which is uh, about 120,000 mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. in the county. Yep. Um, so, it own, you know, 82% of people don't go to church, right? They're not affiliated with the church. They don't go to church, yep. you know, by... For all intents and purposes, there would be this, the assumption that they don't have a Is this relationship like people who with Jesus. To, people who go, like 18% go to church at least once a year? Like, well, I don't know. It's a good question because there was two percentages. There was 18% that go to church regularly, and there was a holiday percentage of 20%. Okay. So but That's still not a big it's jump. It's not a big jump, no. Okay. So the reality is like, all right, if we see that the church is full... And we make the assumption that the church is full because people are, at the very least, becoming more curious about their relationship mm -hmm. with God, mm -hmm. um, are being drawn into relationship with Jesus. Right, right. You know, because we don't we don't make assumptions. It's sometimes it's clear. At least I know we try and make it clear when we talk from the stage during our like hosting time, mm -hmm. we try and make it clear that we know, understand, and expect that there are people who do not yet know Jesus in the congregation right. and that they're welcome. Of course. Right. Yes. Um, but if we were to ask someone the question, is it, what's the, what's the better thing? More people hearing about Jesus or less people? hearing about Jesus. Well, more more people more right? people hearing right? about Jesus. Get so, the... if we if we see that more people are being drawn in like into the ministry of conduit, mm -hmm. why wouldn't we want to make more space for more people to come and hear more about the love of God mm -hmm. to them? In Jesus, yep. Um, and so the reason, really, the the reason that we are starting a second service is not so that we can have a church that says, "Hey, we have two services," or "Hey, we have right. this many people," or "Hey, like our ministry is this successful." The right. reason we are starting a second service is to make more space for more people to come and hear about Jesus. Yep, that's period. That's why we mo do most things. That's why we do most things. The yeah. centrality of Jesus here um, is what we are always aiming for. And like I've told people before, sometimes it's a really big, like sometimes we hit the target, sometimes we miss. Right. But the reality is, is like that's what we are aiming for. So Yeah. Okay. So that's like the main driving reason is like we want to see, we want to see more people get to know Jesus, help people get closer to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And if there's no more room here, if people cannot show up and be part of the community, mm -hmm. they can't do that. So mm -hmm. make more room. Mm -hmm. But Cameron, what about the fact that like, you know, I'm not going to be able to know everyone. Right. Like I'm going to come in on a Sunday morning. There's going to be two services. I'm not going to see some people. 
yep. at different services. I'm not going to know everyone who comes to my church. Correct. What would you say to that conversation? <laughs> I would say correct. You're not, uh, <laughs> you're not, you're not going to know everyone that comes to the church. Okay. Um, and I would say like in two two different ways, like and not to be snarky about it or anything like that or sarcastic about it, but number one is I, I'm I, I'm the lead pastor here. There are like it's very difficult for me to know everyone. Yeah. Like I there are people who I'm like, I think I know their name. Mm-hmm. Just the amount of people that there is. Yep. Right. And I say this and I, I'm just honest about it from the stage. Like, if I call you buddy, I don't know your name. Yep. <laughs> I, I have, don't know, don't know I your have name. swapped people's uh, names. I have like, uh-huh. uh, yeah. I wish um, I, I wish I just wish I wish we had a magic power as pastors to just make it so much easier, but right. it's not. No, it's not. Um, and so the reality is, is that you don't know everyone's name now. Yeah. You don't. You and you probably didn't know everyone's name when the church was 50 people smaller than it even is now, Mm -hmm. just out of like the, the amount of names that a normal person can keep in their head. And so it doesn't really feel for me to, to be the actual issue, like not knowing everyone's name Mm -hmm. uh, because you don't know everyone's name now and you're okay with it. Right. You know? Um, And, and to take that, to follow that rabbit hole even a little deeper, um, you would to make that argument. You would then have to make the argument that knowing everyone's name in church is the goal. Yep, that's the goal. Yeah, the goal is for me to come to a place on Sunday to know everyone's name. Yep, or at least one of the goals. Right. Um, <laughs> and and that's not the goal. I understand. I listen. I from an emotional place. Mm-hmm. I understand. Yeah, and. And all other things being equal, I want to know everyone's name. Mm-hmm. I want to have a deep sense of community. I yeah. want to know everyone that I worship with. But the reality is I don't and I can't. Um, so so, so I get it. I'm not like saying yeah. that it's an it's a unreasonable ask. Yeah. Well, so like here's a story I can share from the previous church that I was at that doesn't exist anymore. Um, but it was a small church plant in the city of Chicago. Our biggest service we ever had was maybe like 40 people. Mm-hmm. That was like opening weekend or something like that. We, our numbers fluctuated from like 15 people to like 30 people. We mm-hmm. could not get past like that number 40. And I, you know, so small church, right? And I was there for a number of years and, you know, we're a very dedicated, beautiful community, love everyone who was a part of that church. It was really special. And we were having, I think it was a Friendsgiving or a Christmas party. I can't remember which. And I remember two individuals who had been part of our church for like two years, both. Like they were very involved in the church, like not people who you didn't see ever. Mm-hmm came in and met each other for the first time Mm -hmm. at like this Friendsgiving. And I was like, what? (laughs) Like, how have you guys been going to the same church? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We are not big. Yeah. And you guys have it like, they're like, oh, I think I've seen you. They just never introduced themselves, never had a conversation. Mm -hmm. They tended to just oscillate on different weeks of not being there. Mm -hmm. And they just didn't know each other. Yep. Crazy. Crazy. Yeah. And mm-hmm. that happened at that church there. I, you know, I've seen that same thing happen here. Yeah. Like, yep. watched it happen. Like, oh, they yeah. go to our church or, you know, it, it it happens now. Yeah. I would say that, like, the number one goal is not that we know everyone's name. The number one goal is that everyone knows the name of Jesus. Yeah. So we want to be concerned about names. Yeah. Let's ask the question. How do we make space for more people to yeah. know the name of Jesus? Right. And I do think I do think it's important that like you know some people's names, that you have a sense of community, right? That's why we're we talk a lot about small groups and mm-hmm. building and I'm well, at least I am talking a lot about small groups. Mm-hmm. And I know you do too. Mm-hmm. But like we want to get people connected into those smaller units. Cause like, yeah, it's unreasonable for you to know 150 plus 200 people's names. Mm-hmm. Um but like 
maybe 10 or 15 mm-hmm. in your small group yeah. and like create that greater sense of community and growth there. Like, yeah. It's not that we don't want you to know no anyone's name. Like that's not a good situation either. No, yeah, we want that. We, I mean, the, knowing someone's name is like the first step to actually genuine connection with them. Right. So, yeah, so of course we want that. Yeah, we don't want to create a church where no one knows anyone's name. Right. No, that's not what we're trying to no. create. No. Uh. Uh-uh. Yeah. It's um, that balance. Yeah. So is it is this is this whole thing just about the numbers? No. Yes. No. Yes. Yes. No. Um, are we just trying to pad our numbers? Nope. In fact, I, I think you and I have talked about going back to the small group conversation. Mm-hmm. I would almost like in order to put our pri- right priorities in the right place in terms of discipleship and growth mm-hmm. and everything like that. I'm almost more I mean, like, I'm going to stop counting like Sunday attendance mm-hmm. and, and start- make and start counting small group attendance, right? Make mm-hmm. that the metric. For of, how healthy we for are. how healthy we are, yeah. Um, and so in that way, like, do numbers matter? Well, no, they don't. They don't matter. I don't care about the numbers, but at the same time, I do care about the numbers because every number is a person. Is a person, right? Every number is a person. Every person has a story. Um, um, every person is created in the image and likeness of God. Um. Every person is made for relationship with God. Mm -hmm. Every person has a heart that needs transformed by Jesus. And so I will count the people because people are important to God. and So they're important to us. So is it about the numbers? Well, no, but it's also not not about the numbers. Right. Um, All right. Is one service going to be better than the other service we're gonna are we gonna be are we gonna have services that compete with one another with one another for how they're gonna be better man we kind of talked long and hard about like this dynamic in the way that we kind of approached um even how we're doing two services in the way we kind of thought about it Mm -hmm. because we were thinking like well let's just because we were like well do they need to be the same Right? Does each service need to look the same? Mm-hmm. And we were kind of on that track or that trail a mm-hmm. little bit of like thinking, okay, we should make them as similar as possible. But I think we were both sensing that like that was probably too big of a burden for our size and scale. On our volunteers. On our volunteers. Mm-hmm. And it was going to, like, it was going to lead to one service feeling like we were kind of trying to make it into something it wasn't. Right. So we actually tried to differentiate the services, mm-hmm. make them a little bit different, um, but not in any way try and say that one is better than the other. Mm-mm. Nope. They're right. just different. Yep. Yeah. So our... Service that's going to be downstairs in the multi-purpose room. Right. First early service. The first the early service, the, not, the 9 a.m. service is going to be like, there's going to be tables in the back and um, going to have a, a lower seating capacity. Yep. That service will. Um, we're hopeful that the kind of the smaller room, mm-hmm. smaller environment, and then like, table setting fellowship area type of thing will provide an opportunity for families who decide to come yep. to have a little bit more comfortable environment mm-hmm. where they can sit with their kids at a table and do coloring pages mm-hmm. and still worship and still hear a message and still pray together and uh, all of that. And the preaching is going to be, it's going to be the same sermon. Same sermon. Same sermon, same preacher. Yep. It's going to be the same worship team. Yep. Um, it might be, you know, we might have one or two less elements on the stage down here than we right. would upstairs just because of acoustics and sound and space. all of that and space. And so is it going to, are they going to be the, are they going to be different? Yeah, they're going to be different. Yep. Are they going to be, is it a lot of it going to be the same? Yes, it's going to be the same because we, my my intent is to bring the same heart for the people, mm-hmm. the same leadership style, 
yep. the same preaching, the same love for the people, the same desire to hunger after God and his word. And, um, and so I, um, but then the, the service that we have upstairs, the later service is going to be in a big, beautiful sanctuary yep. with a full, full worship team, mm-hmm. same sermon once again. Yep. Um, Conduit Kids is going to be offered during that service, right. so that um, you know you that your your kids will have a you know, pur- purpose built environment for them, appropriate like yep. lessons and teaching, right? And so um, families, you know, like we we I I hope I really I I really hope that families go to that service mm-hmm. so that kids can. Get age appropriate discipleship. Correct, you know, or or that, or that families who attend together the the first service mm-hmm. then allow their kids to experience conduit kids, right? And then they choose to serve mm-hmm. during the second service. Yep. So they're serving either in conduit kids or in hospitality or safety team or parking or yep. um, in some other way, shape or form. Really is. Kind of one of the one of the reasons that we yeah. did that the way that we're doing it, well, not having kind of kids in both services. Yeah, well, because like we wanted to give, we recognize that like it's um, we wanted to give our volunteers a more sustainable way of doing ministry because like we hear from a lot of people that they lament that like they when they serve they feel very disconnected from community. They didn't get to participate in the adult worship mm-hmm. or the teaching. And so this provides an opportunity for people to, like, because, like, uh, sometimes on a Sunday morning you come into church, you're feeling rushed, and you're serving that morning, you come down to huddle, we pray, and then you go off and you go serve the kids, and then you kind of leave by the time all the kids are gone, all the other adults are gone, and you just kind of leave, and you feel very disconnected. Mm -hmm. Maybe you had fun with the kids. I know my wife has a blast when she serves in CK with the kids. Mm -hmm. Um, But... What if you had a different rhythm for that? You could, you know, you could come in, participate in a full service, hear the sermon, participate in worship in the community, be filled up in a sense, and then come and serve out of that in the second service, Mm -hmm. feeling really connected and able to bless the kids with that. I think that's, you know, that's one of the many reasons we kind of thought about this. Right. It's our vision and hope for that. Yeah. So I, I don't think that one service is going to be better than no. the, another. I think it's just going to be like what service fits you know, maybe your family better, and then what serve and then and how and then how does that inform your passion yep. to serve yeah. other people in the church? Right. What would you say, Cameron, to those for someone who's like, oh, like I've got two services. Maybe I'm going to go to the one service, and this is actually an opportunity for me to not serve anymore, actually. Yeah. I would say um, that we, Conduit is not a product to be consumed. Mm-hmm. Um, church in general is not a product to be consumed. And it would concern me, that that heart attitude would concern me. Um, because I think what it, what it shows is that we have divorced or separated in our own mind or in our own heart, the act of serving as an act of worship. Mm. We have said that serving is separate from worship. It's not something it's, it's, it's just flat out volunteering. Like I would volunteer at, you know, whatever. I feel like I have to volunteer at the service that I go to because I take yeah. part of it. It's like my way for paying for it or something. Right. right. But I think that serving, um, serving an outreach, serving mm-hmm. a ministry team, serving kind of a kids or hospitality or safety or parking or, you know, whatever. So I think serving is a found both foundational and formational aspect of worship. Mm-hmm. Serving changes us. Yep. Serving um, forms us more into the image and likeness of Jesus. When Jesus had one night left to live, hmm. the thing that he chose to do was humble himself in service of those 
um, that were closest to him, yep. his family. Mm-hmm. Right. In John chapter 13, he washed their feet in the midst of knowing this is the last, this is my last night on earth. What should I do? I will serve. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I think it is really short sighted to say, well, I'm so glad we have an early service because now I can just get my checkbox of, I can check right. my church box off and then I'm free for the mm-hmm. rest of the day to do whatever I want. And what I'm, what I, as your pastor, I would encourage you to say, to before you just choose to do that, that you would ask the Lord, Lord, how would you have me serve as an act of worship? Mm-hmm. My church, my community, right? Um, and 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 allow Him to set your priorities for serving and worship, rather than just being like taking it as a matter of convenience that now you get to be done earlier. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I you know, I think we we've both preached on Sabbath and we both preach on like we we try and exercise healthy boundaries mm-hmm. a lot here. I don't think we're in the vein of trying to ask people to burn themselves out. No. I feel like we very much actually actively work against that. Yeah. Well well and I think this shows that we're actually like desiring to offer people right. who serve a worshipful experience in mm-hmm. one service so that like you said they they serve out of the overflow of right. their heart right right um so yeah yeah so cameron this seems all really complicated mm-hmm. doing two services yeah. fixing up the space down here at the bottom like it's going to make your day longer um all of that why aren't we just doing a building drive why are we not just making a bigger sanctuary cam like yeah. that's the easier thing we would have one service it feel full we'd yeah. have brand new you know all that stuff it'd feel all fancy and shiny like why mm-hmm. are we not just building a bigger sanctuary like every other church yeah great question um and i would say like what could be seen as a merely like a financial question is really, I think, a ministry philosophy question or mm-hmm. min- ministry philosophy answer. Yeah. Because the, the basic answer to that is the amount of money that we would have to spend yeah. to expand our sanctuary. Right. To match the architecture, to... Because it's... Right. Because it's not just the sanctuary, right? It's, it's the parking it's lot. It's the parking lot, it's which, the, which is... Num- Number of bathrooms. Number of bathrooms. Um, it's the number of spaces for kids. Right, because if more people are coming into the sanctuary, we need more space for kids. Yes. So it's not. It's. We're, I mean, you'd be talking about a whole building expansion, right. and what would like just out of curiosity, like I know, I know we've talked about it, but what would be like the conservative number estimate? For like a total property renovation like that here. Oh, you'd be multi millions. Multi millions. Multi millions. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, millions. Without naming church, like there's there there have been churches in the area in the county, in the last decade who have put on major have done major major additions, mm-hmm. new worship centers and classrooms mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And you're talking like the five to seven million dollar range. Um, now. Um, I'm not saying that God no. doesn't provide stuff right. like that. Right. Totally does. What I'm saying is that um, from a philosophical standpoint, like I want to spend my money, I want to spend ministry money on, um, on, on like people and ministry, not bricks and mortar. Mm-hmm. You know, if I if got if I've got a million dollars to spend, mm-hmm. right? I don't want to spend it on new pews and windows and st- like I want to leverage that money for right. ministry and for like the benefit of people. Right. Um, and the reality is, is like you could do a capital campaign, you could take on yeah. um, a mortgage, um, a, mortgage yeah. a loan, a construction loan, or whatever. But then what happens is. Um, you become slave to that yes. debt. Mm-hmm. And now you begin to find yourself doing things in ministry mm-hmm. that 
ensure that you can continue to pay off that debt. Yep. Because it's going to come due every single month. Yep. So you're not, you know, you're not maybe preaching the word as faithfully because you don't want to tick people off because if they leave, then that's not, that's income lost or whatever, right. uh, or tithe, tithes and offerings lost. Yep. And it becomes this kind of albatross mm-hmm. that you need to like maintain. Yep. And then there's just, then there is just the building maintenance right. and the upkeep. And yeah, it's a bigger building. It needs cleaned more. It right. needs, yeah, all of that. And, and we've, we we even talked about the fact that that would impact, like, that would make more choosing choices around staffing, right? Right, like it's a choice between between paying the mortgage or having someone else on like staff, a, a children's ministry pastor right. or a youth pastor or, yep. or something like that. Like, yep. no, I'd rather pay to have more ministry capacity than I would seating capacity. Yep, um, and also like we live in Chautauqua County. New York. Mm-hmm. This is not a mega church area. No. There will never be a mega church yeah. in Chautauqua County because it's not representative of the culture mm-hmm. and the context here. Yeah. Um and and I don't particularly believe that for my gifting and like my personality and the way that like I feel called to do ministry that I really want to lead in a mega church type of capacity where you're just stacking things taller. Right. Um, and so, you know, um, and so some people might say, well, what if the church, grow- like what if you have two services and those both fill up? Well, I, I mean, I mean, we'll cross that bridge when we get there, right. but I'm, I, I tell you what I'm not going to do. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to build a bigger building. Yeah. I might move yeah. to a different building, mm-hmm. one that, you know, better suits our needs. Right. But uh, you're never going to see cranes in this parking lot lifting yeah. huge new trusses. Right. Or anything like that. Uh, because not it's like one, it's out of touch with the neighborhood. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and two, um, I would rather say, okay, why don't we take 50, 80, 100 people mm-hmm. from our current congregation? And why don't we say, why don't we go plant a church? Right. In an area that's underserved in ministry, yep, right, um, and and expand if we're going to expand or grow ministry to do it in that way, right, rather than just like building something bigger, shinier, and fancier that moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal, yeah. And you know, I I don't know if you ever finished listening to that one podcast, but listening to that podcast about executive pastor at this Mm -hmm. large, large, large church. Um, It was one of those churches that built really tall, right? And at the end of the podcast, he's just lamenting, and he's like, if I could say one thing to other churches is don't do what we did. Don't saddle yourself with all of this massive infrastructure in Mm -hmm. massive property, because one of their biggest problems now is what do they do with all this property? Because they were huge they shrunk down for a number of re- reasons and now they have this property that is outsized mm-hmm. what they actually do and what they actually serve with mm-hmm. and they're like what do we do now and that's not just a recent trend that was like a pre-covid trend i went to a um like a church growth church planting conference and every single like mega pass mega church pastor that i like that came up and spoke or I saw in a breakout session was mm-hmm. trying to find ways to get their big church to be smaller. Yep. And I think that needs to be a little bit of a wake up call for us who are maybe on the other side of that spectrum who think that the grass is greener mm-hmm. on at a bigger size mm-hmm. and realize that maybe they are perhaps warning us that maybe going tall, going big as possible in that way is not the thing. It's maybe not, maybe it's not the thing. Not It's, it's certainly not the vibe. Yeah. Not here. Shock <laughs> not the vibe. Not the yeah. vibe. Um, what if someone just says, Cameron, a nine o'clock service an 11 o'clock service. I don't like those times. I really, really like my 10 o'clock service. You can come at 10 o'clock if you want. <laughs> <laughs> like come at 10 o'clock and catch the, you know, the end of the first service and the beginning of the of the second. Like I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I can do it at eight thirty and ten thirty if you want, but it sounds to me like I mean 
forgive your pastor for offending. No, I, I, I don't forgive your. Like, you just want to be offended by. You want something to be. You're disagreeable about that. You yeah. have a disagreeable heart. Get over it. It's like just. Yeah. What about this? Is kind of really unique to the way that we kind of started talking about the early service or, or two services was kind of the way we phrased it early on, and so. I think we should talk about this uh, just to bring any clarity to any miscommunication or over communication at the beginning. But what if I don't have kids? Do I have to have kids or do I have to be serving mm-hmm. in order to go to this early service? Right. Right. Because originally we were considering calling it the family service. Family and ministry service yeah. was the way we it was well, because I was the first one to kind of talk about it. I think you were gone from that family meeting. You were sick. Yep. So I talked about it, and the language I chose around it was family and ministry service. And the reason I did that was to accurately describe the way it was supposed to function mm-hmm. and will function uh, and differentiate it a little mm-hmm. bit instead of just calling it second service, calling it family and ministry service. And I said at that meeting, I did say, that doesn't mean you have to have kids or that you have to be serving in ministry Mm -hmm. in order to attend this service. It just simply means that this service is going to be functioning towards Mm -hmm. those things a little bit different than the other one. Yeah, yeah. But regardless of how clear or unclear I may have communicated Mm -hmm. that, simply attaching that name has created continuous confusion Confusion. since then. Yes, yeah. And uh, no, you can come to whatever service best fits your schedule, whether you're serving on that day or not serving on that day, or you have family or don't have family right. or whatever. Um, yeah. The purpose, again, I mean, we've talked a little bit more about this is that if you do have, if you are say regularly serving in conduit kids, but you don't want to miss worship. Or every time. you want to serve You've never served in conduit kids, but you've always kind of like felt bad about missing service. Exactly. Great point. Great point there. Is that now there's a service for those of you who are in ministry, right? Right. That you can still come to. Um, and if you have, it's the same thing with family. Yep. Like you have kids, right? All right. You can bring the kids to, the, and that that service is going to be. Um, I mean, our, that service is going to be a little bit more perf- purposely tailored right. to families who have little kids and we'll are have, keeping them in their service. We'll ser- have in tables service. in the back, right. drawing things. like Right. And so that's why we call it kind of like the family services. Right. Bring your family. It's okay. The kids are there. Right. Don't get worried or upset about them being a little bit louder right. or it being a little bit more of a rambunctious service. Well, it's a really positive way to communicate. Instead of saying it's it's the no seat it's the no conduit kids service or it's the no children's ministry service right. that's a really negative way to talk yeah. about it. Instead of saying well let's celebrate the fact that the family gets to worship all together right. and all of that all the messiness and goodness that that brings. Yes, so that's really what the whole that that whole like moniker came right. from. But no, if you don't have kids, you can still come to the nine a.m. If you're not serving in ministry that day, you can still come to the nine a.m. Yep. Um, my hope is, is if you come to nine, the 9 a.m., you'll be like, well, yeah, hey, I, I got to worship with my family. Now I'm going to go serve my family mm-hmm. today. Um, and that that would be, you know, that would be a, the, the heart that the Lord develops in you if it's not, you know, if you're not there yet. Um, because, you know, like I said, serving is formational as much as it is foundational to the Christian faith. Yeah. Yeah. So those are some of the kind of the big questions, topics, and things that we kind of are hearing and the things that we've been thinking through and talking through as we're doing this final service or the second service. But I think it mm, deserves mentioning one more time, going back to that first question, why are we doing this? Yeah. Why in the world would we do two services and not just yeah. say, the Lord has blessed us, we have one service and just yeah. be happy with that? Because this is an experiment to see if the Lord wants to keep blessing us. Mm-hmm. It's an experiment to see, like, okay, the Lord has created the increase. Is he done? Yeah. yeah. Is he done with the increase? And if you look at the number of people, 82% in Shaco County that don't know Jesus or are not mm-hmm. connected with the church, my guess is the Lord's not um, satisfied yep. with 18%. That there is, there are more people to, that that 
there are more people to come to know Jesus. Yeah. Uh, and so mm-hmm. uh, that's why we're doing it is to make more space mm-hmm. for more people to come to know Jesus. Mm-hmm. You know, what just came to my mind as we were just you were just talking was a message you gave, mm-hmm. I think last year or maybe it was two years ago. It was one of our tent services outside. You gave a message on the passage where Jesus is in the house. And the friends mm-hmm. get up on the roof, yes. pull the thatching off the roof. Right. Mm-hmm. They lower their friend, their paralyzed friend, down into the middle of this meeting of Jesus because they're like, we got to get him close to mm-hmm. Jesus. Mm-hmm. And they were willing to stretch the limits of that building yeah. in order to get him just physically, proximately yes. closer to Jesus. Yes. I, Is that not the parable? Do I have to preach that? Like, you know what I mean? Like, Mm -hmm. we want to get people closer to Jesus. Mm. We're going to stretch the limits of this building. Yep. We'll take a part of the ceiling out if we need to. Yep. To get people here. Exactly. I'll blow the roof off this place if it means one more person closer to Jesus. Yep. Mm -hmm. So we hope, like, that those some of that some of that conversation is was helpful for you mm-hmm. uh, if you've been having some questions or just want more information about the you know the changes that are coming and they're and, the, and it will change like I'm, we're not gonna well, i'm not trying to right. say that it's going to be the same right we're, it is going to be different than what we're experiencing now but different doesn't mean to need to mean worse and we always can endure change for the right for the right reasons. reasons. For a good why. For a good why. Yep. Mm-hmm. So um, if you have any questions, more questions, maybe you have a question that we didn't answer. Maybe you have a philosophical or methodological question. Maybe you don't go to Conduit at all and you've never even heard of Conduit Ministries, but you watch this podcast or listening, you're yep. thinking about like, well, what, what I, I don't get it or I do get it, but here's a question that I have. Yep. Send it over. Um, like I said, this is much. this is as much for us a philosophical and methodological ministry question as it is like a informational right um bit of information yeah. for those who go to conflict because there's a reason that we're not just saying uh more people should go online You're right because we could solve that problem that way mm-hmm. but we're choosing not to mm-hmm. right and we talked about that in other episodes. Yeah, and don't even get me started on more people online. I know you were getting into an argument on fa- on Instagram yesterday. I almost yeah. commented on it. Um. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, um. So anyway, thanks for listening. Uh, appreciate your uh, appreciate your your presence here. Yeah. Um, leave us a question, a comment, um, like this episode, wherever you're listening, yeah. share it with your friends, subscribe to it if you're not. Yeah. If you're listening listening to this audio podcast, leave us a review. That would be yes. fantastic. We'd really appreciate it. You could that. be our first review. <laughs> really? We have zero reviews? Uh, last I looked, I don't think we have any. Oh, wow. Um, I don't so, know what to make of that. I, I think you just haven't talked about it. That's honest. true. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Review us, please. Um, and our text line is 716-201-0507. Thanks for listening.